well, I wanted to just say welcome, everyone. Uh, the Prime Branding panel is always one of the highlights of the fall for me, and I appreciate being able to uh, say welcome. And uh, the Prime Branding panel is in its fifth year. That's hard for me to, to think about. Uh, special thanks to the panelists, to Timmy, to the to the Prime organization, and to uh, Jennifer Coupland, who has been shepherding the group. So I'm going to turn it over to Isabel. I don't want to waste time. I'm sure you have better things to listen to than me. <laughs> Isabel. Awesome. Hi. I'd just like to start off by thanking everybody for being here today, especially the panelists. I know you guys have really busy schedules, so we appreciate you taking the time to be here with us. Also to Jennifer Coupland and Timmy Gard, who have been working with us tirelessly from, I think it was around June that we started out. So again, thank you to them as well as anybody from SMEAL and from the Comm School who have been promoting and working hard to support this event. I'd also like to thank the Prime Executive Board. You guys have been amazing with this. And I'm gonna pass it over to Leah to talk about ADPR's contribution as well. Hi everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Leah. I'm the president of the ADPR Club this year. Um, and I just wanted to say a quick thank you as well to Prime for collaborating with us. This is the second year that we worked with them with this event. And I just want to say thank you to Timmy and Jennifer. It's so nice to have worked with you guys and hopefully in the future. Um, and thank you to the panelists. I know I'm so excited to hear what you guys have to say. Um, so now I'll pass it off to Timmy, I believe, and we'll get us started. Geez, I feel like Ryan Seacrest in American Idol. It's like, it's like pretty cool. Okay, here's what we're going to do for the next hour. But before we do that, yeah, just one big thank you to Toby and Isabel and Sebastian and, and Leah for keeping me straight. Jen, couldn't do this without you when we started five years ago and blue chip with an idea. Having ideas are one thing, executing is a different, uh, different idea um, to, get, to get in place. Aaron, from your admin support, has been great. And most of all, the participants, uh, the six of you that I've spoken to individually. We have you know, representatives from you know, Amazon, Nike, Google, ING, Slack, in context. And what I want to do for the next couple of minutes is just have each of the panelists just take a few seconds to introduce themselves. So I'll be leading that and then we're going to get into a Q&A um, for the next hour till seven o'clock and then we have breakout rooms. So Kaylee, I'm going to start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself real quick? Sure. And, and first, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Kaylee. I am Global Brand Relations at Amazon. I lead a team of brand ambassadors who partner with brands on their intellectual property concerns. I've been in the brand protection industry for about 10 years now, previously working for the Motion Picture Association, as well as Mark Monitor. Terrific. Melanie? Yeah. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Um, very excited to be here as well. Um, I am the North America uh, brand manager for Nike Soccer. Um, been working at Nike now for five years. Penn State alum, like the rest of the panelists. Um, and sport is my absolute passion. So I'm really excited to, and if anyone else on the call um, is also sport is their passion, I'm really excited to kind of answer these questions and give you guys a window into an industry that has really changed my life and um, and I love doing what I do every single day. So I'm excited to be here. Okay. Ashley, you're next. Hi everyone, I'm Ashley Vargas. I am a product marketing manager at Google. I am specifically on their search ad team. So working with um, B2B uh, with different customers in uh, many different industries. I actually just joined Google in January and prior to that was in the fashion industry at Lacoste and then prior to that was at Moroccan Oil. Um, so really passionate about the consumer goods space specifically. Um, and then personally, i um, huge Penn State fan. Uh, my uh, younger brother actually just graduated from Penn State last year. And so I love the, the Penn State family pride. Um, and then personally, I'm also really passionate about running. And uh, I have one senior dog that I, that I love. Super. Stacy. Hi, I'm Stacey Britt Fitzgerald. I am the VP of Marketing for IMG Fashion, which is the group that runs New York Fashion Week, Australian Fashion Week, um, and some other global fashion properties. 
Um, prior to that, I lived in London. I was the global director of marketing for Urban Outfitters. Um, have worked in tons of digital media spaces um, in marketing partnerships and uh, digital sponsorships. Um, and hopefully today, my cat Marley will make an appearance uh, and walk in front of the screen. So uh, let's hope for that. Um, and in terms of Penn State, I actually am probably the only person in the history of the world to transfer out of Penn State. So I hope you guys will forgive me for that and um, give, give me a chance here. <laughs> okay, no worries. <laughs> Jamie? Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie Earhart. Um, of course, Penn State alum. I actually was on the swim team, um, so I am very a big fan of Penn State and also of sports as well. Um, I have been in the industry, marketing advertising industry for over 17 years, working first um, at MGM Studios and then moving over into the advertising agency side. So really got a crash course across a wide range of products and services and categories and have become um, really, interested and excited about the technology space. So of course I live in the Bay Area um, and I'm currently the head of brand marketing at Slack with experience at Adobe and Intel among a few other tech brands as well. I'm cool. excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yep. And last, Tiffany, last but not least. Tiffany? Hey everybody. I did not go to Penn State, so I'm extra excited to be in this group. Um, I have worked in-house with a bunch of retail brands and editorial properties. Um, I'm a storyteller. About three years ago, I transitioned to doing my own thing. So my sister and I co-founded Context & Co, which is a creative direction and brand marketing consultancy based in Brooklyn. Um, I'm working right now on a project with Elf Cosmetics and Alicia Keys. Um, but I've done branding work and concepting work for brands like Zappos Kids and all of the Ann Taylor properties, Loft, Lou and Gray, and Ann Taylor. Um, and again, I'm just excited to talk about how storytelling and career can come together to do cool things for all of us. Awesome. Okay, we're actually just one minute over what I thought would be perfect, so it is perfect. So here we go, let's get going here, right? First question, I'm gonna direct it to you, Melanie, right? I call it the next normal, not the new normal. You know, we all kind of know what that is, right? What's the biggest challenge you have in branding under the current next normal environment? Well, honestly, for, for us as a company, um, the hardest thing is <clears throat> that sport has not resumed in a normal fashion. Um, and that really is ultimately what the well, one of the biggest powers of our storytelling revolves around is the spirit, the passion, um, those insane moments. I mean, Lakers and five, that's all I'm going to say there. But yeah. all of those, all of those, all those things revolve around what's done on the court, what's done on the pitch. Um, so this new or next normal that is quite frankly affecting our athletes um in multiple ways not just that they can't have fans but that some are even being diagnosed um so i think the power of our brand and the power of sports still exists but it's kind of reminding everyone each and every day that they can still have that connection to sport even though um not as many games are being played or you're not seeing as much professionalism you know on the tv screen right Kayla, you want to jump into that question? Sure. I think as Amazon as a whole, being an e-commerce uh, marketplace, clearly this works well in terms of we're able to ship to customers, we're able to continue the majority of operations, but in the area of brand protection, there's been a significant impact because most of these conversations happen in conferences, in settings where you're in closed door spaces, the subject matter is very sensitive. And so where we are able to evangelize our message and get our tools and programs out there tended to be in person in large conference settings. Obviously that's been very much uh, impacted by COVID and the current environment. So we've had to shift to how we actually connect with our customers on these very sensitive topics using things like webinars and other mechanisms to reach those customers where they're at. And we've lost some things. I mean, there's a lot of, that you get from interaction 
from direct interaction. There's a lot of trust and communication that exists that's two way. When you're meeting in a large conference room, you can have side meetings or meetings after the fact. And what I've found with my team is you lose a little bit of that richness, but what you gain is scale. So you're able to reach more customers. So we've been able to really expand our message and get it out there beyond the typical brand that we would be you know, communicating this to. And it's even now coming part of the consumer awareness. Um, so in many ways, it's been a challenge, but also we've been able to adjust uh, and learn from it to be able to scale our communications externally. Thank you. Stacey, I have a question for you. What are some of the ways that the onslaught of social media has changed branding in the next normal? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, social media has become more important than ever, right? I mean, I think everyone, especially, you know, the, the generation we're speaking to right now, you guys have, have grown up with social media, so it's, it's no surprise to you. I think that, you know, now it's about reaching all age groups, you know, and it's, it's more important than ever. And I think, you know, in the beginning, there, there's kind of been different stages of how social media has changed during the pandemic, right? At the beginning, everyone was jumping onto the lives, right? Like, oh, this is our way to reach the customer. And a lot of these lives were kind of like, womp, womp. And then like slowly, a couple of weeks later, people started having more um, professionally produced live productions, right? And look at like Versus, which is like, incredible organic um, Instagram phenomenon where it was just, you know, two people at home playing their favorite songs. And then last week, you've got like two major uh, icons of music in a professional soundstage. Um, and I think that we're all just seeing that the ways that we could take so social media to the next level um, and create incredible productions, you know, the Emmys included. Um, so I think that's been a big learning for all of us, how social cannot just be like, another channel, but the channel. Good. Ashley, I'd like to hear your feedback on that. Yes, definitely. I think that in terms of social media and the way that people are just interacting with each other has completely evolved. Um, at Google, specifically on my team, uh, I work really closely with our social media editor who runs the Google Ads um, social page. And it's the way people are interacting and the way that people want to consume information has has changed. And even speaking on behalf of like my core work, um, we I have like a big event that I uh, put on every every June our team puts on and you know events as we know it are not happening. They're all virtual. And um, quite frankly, a lot of a lot of people that are working from home don't really want to go to a B2B event that is typically, you know, a two day conference at their home and people have a lot of things going on, whether, um, you know, you're a working parent or um, whether, you know, you are you're sick from the virus there's many different variables to it and so um it's really even like you know pivoting like not only your social media strategy and like leveraging that but also like thinking like how does this fuel my event strategy and like how can i make like a virtual event more snackable for people because people's attention spans now like we thought that that was bad before they are it's so much worse now um so we have to be so snackable in everything we do Tiffany, I have a question for you. Being a consultant working in many different verticals and companies, how has the pandemic COVID-19 changed the way products are marketed? I mean, I'd say first off, what we can all see in our Instagram feed and what we can see in all of our digital channels is that there's a lot more photography that doesn't feature a lot of story infusion into it. So you don't go on a lot of location you know, based photo shoots where you have 10 models and different interaction and there's an overhead shot of people eating dinner together. Like those things are, are not happening right now. And if you're seeing them right now, they're happening like with a lot of money involved or they're old, you know, old stuff that's being refreshed. So I'd say it's forced, it's forced people that we're working with to get more creative, but also to get more um, aware and in touch with what people are actually doing in their lives. I think a lot of times, advertising traditionally comes from a place of aspiration and what aspiration can can feel like is that you are projecting onto someone what their life could be and then you're selling into that um, but a lot of times now i think branding has to come from a place of really really truly feeling connected to who you're branding to and understanding that the most compelling story is going to be the one that meets them where they are 
um, which can often mean that it's a photo shoot of a glam celebrity that was done by their seven-year-old child. And that's what the photo on the cover of the glossy magazine is now. Um, it's not done by like a high power photographer. Um, it could mean that it is a lot more UGC content that's being produced at a level that now is, you know, going on billboards in Times Square, where, you know, six months ago, that was, that was not what you wanted to be, you know, told you were going to do in a meeting. So I don't know. I, I think, I think it's taken, taken us some interesting places. We call it building the brand in, from the inside out back at our place. That's a good answer. Thank you. Jamie, you and I talked a little bit about today. You're in a kind of unique position right now coming from your company and you've got competitors out there like Teams and Zoom and, and the like. Um, coming from such large companies as yourself, what are some of the challenges you're now faced with during the branding process as we're going through this crazy time period? I mean, for where we are at Slack, we recognize our audience and our key customers are our knowledge workers across the globe. So all of us, you know, educated and working the large workforce, and we had a significant, significant disruption at different times this spring in an abrupt change to working from home and no longer being in the office. So um, what that faced as just a global workforce is a huge change in how we work with our colleagues, how we communicate, how we collaborate, um, and feeling responsible to deliver also for our business and to retain our jobs and feeling that pressure um, with macroeconomic change um, that this is causing to be able to, to succeed and retain our, our work. And so as an organization, we're really focusing on enabling our customer success. So what can we do to help people along that massive shift? Um, and I think across the broader category, even including organizations like Zoom, we're all in the same position. So prior to this time, people were pretty fine with the status quo. It was very email was the default, meetings, conference rooms were the default. Um, and there's a huge change for people to think about more efficient and effective ways of working. So I don't know that the broader workforce is ever going to go back to a full nine to five at, at uh, you know, an office building. So what does that look like for us as, as a culture, as a work culture, and what are the right tools to take us into the future? And I think there's a bunch of us that are forging that path. Good. Um, my next question, I'm going to have a couple of you answer, but I'll start with Melanie. Melanie, how do you build a brand strategy? It's a great question. Um, you know, that's something that I felt, especially in my time at Penn State, we definitely, we looked at so many various companies and, and how they built their brand strategies. And I have to say, there, there was a ton that I didn't fully understand. So once I got to, you know, this huge corporation that is Nike, the, the beast that is Nike, um, every uh, category kind of looks a little bit different. And the way that you build, or at least the way that you start your brand strategy, and we, some of it's been mentioned here, is to really hone in on that key consumer, that key target. Um, our matrix organization is built in a way uh, that focuses on categories, which is why I told you guys that I uh, support and focus solely on Nike soccer. Um, so what we do first and foremost is understand who our target consumer is and what they need and what they want. Um, and so spending time really, um, really breaking down that consumer and figuring out segments from there. Um, after that, everything is seasonally based as, as we tie it back to um, our, our seasonal products. And, and those are where those um, lead stories, secondary stories come in from the product that's ultimately developed, whether that's footwear, apparel, equipment. And then you can get into the understanding of um, whether the basis is around innovation or it is true um, Nike history and heritage. That's kind of where some of the biggest breaks um, come as far as our lead products from season to season. Um, so as we build those branding strategies, um, our, our matrix organization goes, uh, goes pretty deep as far as um, which teams work on which strategies and when they come to life. So I think the other piece in understanding, um, you know, maybe just the way that Nike looks at it, because every, every company will, um, you know, format their, their marketing teams differently. 
Um, but we have three year and year long strategies that are developed from our global teams, which are also broken into that same category sort of distinction. Um, so really what I do in North America is, is take those strategies that are ultimately handed off to us and, and understanding those key consumer targets and format our campaigns or what we ultimately bring to life season to season on what makes sense for our specific geographic territory. So I think in understanding how to build that strategy, it really comes down to not just that consumer target and where we're focused, um, but ultimately the overall global strategy um, that we align to as a sport category. Stacy, how do you build a brand strategy? Yeah, um, I mean, that, it, that's a huge question. <laughs> um, and uh, you did such a good job of answering it. I think, you know, one thing that's interesting, similarly to, to, to the way social media has become, um, you know, the channel, right? I think a lot of brands and the brands that I've worked for in particular, uh, we discovered that those long-term strategies are really hard to uh, continue to march towards in a world that's shifting nonstop, right? And I think, you know, COVID has shown us that uh, fully. Like, no matter what you thought you were marketing to, uh, you know, this summer, that all shifted at a moment's notice, right? And, you know, working at Urban Outfitters, which obviously has a huge youth base, um, so much of, of what we, we would be messaging on any given day would be very much tied to the cultural landscape. So whether it's um, as, as simple as, you know, a meme going viral to, um, you know, there being a major uh, environmental disaster in California and how does that affect young people who live in that state? Um, what does our messaging look like? Um, you know, around the election, so many young people uh, feeling really upset at, about who won and then um, you know, us targeting those young people. What does that look like? How should we be messaging them so that we don't seem like we're, we're tone deaf to the world? So I think brand strategy kind of constantly has to evolve um, based on what's happening in the world. But I think another thing that's really important to, to remember is that you'll always have your internal brand strategy. And what happens internally is tends to often be very different from what the world thinks of your brand. Right. And that you have to sort of battle between those two because, you know, there's CMO marketing, which is like what your boss thinks the world thinks about your brand and what you should be saying. And then there's sort of like what you hear in the street when you tell people where you work. And I think finding that balance between those two and, and listening to the customer, but also pushing what it is that you want to say about the brand is um, sort of that secret sauce. Tiffany, you were shaking your, you were nodding your head. Yeah. You want to add into that, please? I think, I think the, the CMO, the CMO example is great. I mean, I think there are lots of companies that spend so much time and money getting consultants to tell them what they need to do to be the kind of company that is cool or relevant. And in fact, that's not where their bread is buttered and that's not where they're actually going to prioritize. And that's not where they're going to, you know, take the advice. And I think, I think it's important for them to be honest with themselves about that. Um, and it's more helpful to the people working within the company to feel like there's a trust there. That's what's happening. Um, it's key, but it does not always happen. Yeah. Well, my next question. You know I, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, Timmy. Go. I just wanted to weigh in on something Stacy said, which I completely can empathize with, especially being in such a large company like Amazon. There's general foundational principles about how we market and how we talk about things. And in general, we're humble. We don't do big announcements. It's very kind of mild, let it kind of grow grassroots, get that information out there, start testing. Um, usually there's not a big launch or big announcement. Um, however, we learn that doesn't work in all segments. There's certain areas, especially areas that are risky from a regulatory standpoint for us, specifically brand protection, where you actually want to get out in front and you want to say things and you want to talk about the work that you're doing. And so you have to be flexible enough to be true to your corporate culture while also taking into consideration what your overall objectives are and who your core customer is and what you're trying to achieve to be able to influence your ultimate strategy. And I think that's a really critical element that many companies forget. You threw a word in there, testing, which kind of leads me to my next question, which is basically for you, Ashley and Jamie. So I'll start with you, Kaylee. And it's a, it's a question that I always ask and some of the students wanted me to ask it, but I'm going to come at it a different way. How do you use market research to measure brand satisfaction, awareness, usage, and how do you leverage your customer base in giving you the insights and learnings um, 
that you are trying to get across. I do not want any of you to answer this from a proprietary point of view, but basically, what's the implication upon using research? So, Jamie and 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 um, and, um, 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 well, Kaylee, I'm going to start with you first. Sure. Um, market research is extremely important and it can happen in many different ways and it depends upon um, who the consumer group you're trying to target. Uh, one of the really most compelling and it sounds rudimentary but surveys tend to be very helpful. Um, from our point of view, we try to get direct feedback after a specific experience has occurred. So once something occurs, give us feedback on that experience and then also give us feedback on your overall experience. So in the past 12 months, you know, how many times have you interacted with Amazon? How many times have you had a positive experience, et cetera? Um, so surveying large groups is a very critical way to get that feedback and then use that data to ultimately measure progress as well, because what you're going to get are learnings that you can then apply and ultimately measure over the long term if it's impactful. If it's not, you need to adjust strategy. If it is, potentially double down or continue to survey and get more insight. So I would say that's probably one of the most important for us. I would also uh, say anecdotes. We are very close to our customers, especially in the brand protection space. We have entire teams dedicated to having those direct conversations with our core customer of those particular programs. And we want that direct feedback to be fed into overall product development, our engineering roadmaps, and we use that to do so. And so I would say those direct anecdotes directly from our customer are also important. Good. Now, Jamie, now it's your turn. Then Ashley, I'm gonna have you answer. Sure. Um, I've worked on brand tracker research uh, with most brands that I've worked with throughout my experience and implemented this research at Slack as well. Um, the idea is that you're getting an ongoing pulse of the growth and traction of your brand within an organization. And I think there are some newer ways to do it, which are um, a little more nimble and probably a little more, uh, the cadence is faster because things are changing so quickly, but keeping a pulse on uh, who's aware of your brand, what the perception is, what affinity is, like ability, re relevance. These are all critical in understanding how your brand is tracking positively or negatively with your audience base. I also think it's really important within an organization to be able to prove and put some research and numbers behind brand value. Um, and that's how you measure it. So brand, in my opinion, is an external audience's experience, any experience that they have with their brand or product. Um, so that could be, you know, having an issue, buying something at a store, um, you know, going onto a website, experiencing an ad, all those things over time grow. Um, and the value of the brand is seen in the overall perception across, across time. So ensuring that you have a pulse on how your audience is reading your brand over time allows you to prove the value in your brand, that incremental value in the brand. Um, and then layering on top of that, I would say that market research on specific subject matter expertise can be really valuable. Slack, we're creating and part of creating a new category of tools. Um, and so for us, it's really understanding what the shifts in culture are and how we can optimize our product to the needs of our customers. So we have ongoing studies to understand those changes in workplace culture. And then we also, just as Kayla was mentioning, we have, we stay really connected with our clients and our customers, our users to understand when we are making product improvements, how are they responding positively or negatively? So market research, yes, there's lots of different ways you can do it depending on the needs of um, your brand and business, but I think it's critical to have that outside in perspective. Ashley, you had the longest time to think about it, so you've got to come up with a really good answer. Yes, these answers are all really good, and I agree with all of them. I would say that research should really be, if you have the resources for it, really should be like step one of your 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 thought process when you're developing that marketing strategy, and that I think is. I think of it as like your secret weapon, like this is your secret sauce that will kind of fuel your your strategy. And uh, especially from a marketing standpoint, um, when I'm in a room with a bunch of different stakeholders, product, engineer, sales, what I want is that secret weapon to say like here, like these are the insights, the high level insights that I learned from XYZ research study. And by doing that, you're, what you're doing is bringing the voice of the customer to the table. 
And I think that that's really like our job as a marketer is to always think of the customer and to bring their voice to the table um, and to really have that perspective there. Um, so research could come in many different forms. And I think in my career, I was actually, um, I always thought that research would be expensive. And so a lot of the times when I was at smaller companies, I was always kind of shy to bring up research um, just because I knew like there was always like, you know, talks about budget and it's not easy to get budget for these kinds of things. Um, and now I'm realizing that research could be done scrappy. Like Kaylee said, you could conduct a survey and that, you know, is a very low cost solution to get user feedback. And in addition to that, we do at least at Google, a bunch of roundtable discussions where we invite you know, a handful of clients to give feedback on a new tool that we are launching and having that just interaction um, about the tool and just like open, open discussion and honesty about the tool is a great, great way to, um, to, yeah, to, to build trust with that customer and release a product that they're actually, that they're actually going to use and they actually think is helpful. And so instead of kind of guessing what you think people want, I think like going to actually speak to the customer to, to ensure that your uh, thought process is correct is super important. Thank you. Good answer from all of you. Tiffany, again, in the consulting world and working with many different companies, we hear the word immersion a lot, you know, the word immersion and ties into a brand workshop. What is a brand workshop and how would you characterize that in building a brand? Okay, the question I think you're asking when you say a brand workshop is like, what would I offer someone and call it a branding workshop? Correct. Correct, okay. So I think we all know the term focus group. I think we've actually listening and listening to the things that Kaylee, Ashley, and Jamie were talking about before. It is an internal version of a lot of those same exercises. Um, so a branding workshop can look like a survey um, that's done with people that are internal to a team. Um, or it can look like a survey that's done to the highest value customer. Um, and it can be as simple as me saying like, okay, I don't work here. I don't have any opinions about who I think is the most important person in the room. So if you hire me, I'll come in, I'll speak to everyone as if they're equal. And I'll tell you what 10 people that I just asked actually said about your brand, because they don't know that I work for you and they don't know you. Um, and then from that, I will say, why don't you tell me what you want people to think about your brand? what can you authentically do or what are you authentically doing right now that helps you show up as that brand? How far are you willing to change in order to get to this other perception? Um, how much are you invested in this other perception? Um, and then working with people to hold themselves accountable to that. I mean, I think a workshop is only, any exercise that I come to into a company and do is only as valuable as what they can truly do with the information or the revelations that they get out of it. Um, sometimes I think it's just lowering the temperature in the room and saying like, this is just information. What do we want to do with it? It's not, it's good or bad. I think sometimes strategies go off course because someone's tied to, it was my idea, or I like that version, or I wish people liked it versus this is what actually works. Uh, people like the uglier website. Nobody's buying that thing. Um, so workshops often help say those things without anyone getting their feelings hurt. <laughs> yeah. Stacey, you were nodding your head and smiling. I know you were yeah, not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, you know, when it, when it comes to research, um, I'm not the biggest fan of like surveys, right? I kind of look at them, which I know is, is bad to say in a branding workshop, but I think it's, it's not dissimilar to when you like look at a restaurant's Yelp page, right? And, and they have all these bad reviews and you're like, hell I love that place but you realize people writing those reviews are a very special subsect of people and I think a lot of people who answer surveys also are, are a special subsect of people so I think to that end like a, a workshop or a focus group is really interesting because it is a bit more um qualitative and you actually have people in the room and they're, they're either touching the product or looking at the designs and you feel like you get a better sense of what they're saying and I think to that end, whether it's a branding workshop or even something like looking at the actual like analytics of your of your website, looking at the data of your social media, I find so often that you know when I go into uh, you know a senior executive's office and they think one thing, and then I share, well, actually last week we posted a photo of 
A, B, and C, and it got the most likes ever. And they're like, huh. And, and they, can't, they can't refute it, right? Because it's, it's undeniable that something here connected. So then it's about unpacking that so you can recreate that. Um, so, so to that end, I think, you know, a focus group and, and having someone who's sort of, hey, I'm not here to judge what you're doing, but this is what I saw is, is a brilliant way to reach some of your more hesitant executives. And I just want to add on too, like we're in the, I, I'm in the business of influencing internal stakeholders, right? I want to influence their product roadmaps. I want to influence their strategic direction in line with what I hear from customers. And then I want to influence my customers to actually use and appreciate and like what we're building. And one of the really great ways to do that, to your point, Stacey, is connect them. So bring them in the same room and let them talk to each other. And then I'm obviously the conduit for the conversation and I can help translate because sometimes they do speak different languages. We all know tech people, they speak a different language sometimes. And so to help be, like, bring that, those two people together, I have found to be extremely impactful at driving alignment between these two groups, the customer and the, old, the people who are actually building the tools and programs. Ashley, you're nodding your head. You would like to add to that as well from Google? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I think that like a core role of uh, marketing and especially at larger organizations is kind of playing project manager, aka also translator. And so <laughs> yeah. it's like, okay, whether it's like your exact or it's a very technical person, it's like, how do we simplify this really complex concept? make it so easy that like really a sixth grader could understand it. And, and that's kind of the marketing's role through that process. So I think focus groups are a great way to kind of say like, hey, this is firsthand like customer quotes, what they're saying and to have like the decision makers, the technical people in the room, I think, um, you know, makes, makes your life easier. Timmy, you are on mute, my friend. Sorry about that. Thank you. It must have hit my hand. Melanie, what makes your brand admirable? I love this question. Um, at, well, actually, when we were talking, well, there, there's been so many great insights into marketing research and I'm going to kind of marry the two topics together with the question that you just asked to me. Good. Um, so my first job at Nike was an Eakin. So if you've never heard that before, Eakin is actually Nike backwards. Um, Eakins are product experts and insights collectors that are placed all across our geographic territories um, and put into cities, not just our major cities where we have offices, but they're um, put into secondary and tertiary cities from a marketing standpoint, right? Not where we ultimately focus all of our energy. And the entire point of placing Eakins or product experts in those cities is because um, that balance of um, data information that we obtain from a consumer insight standpoint sometimes only covers the big cities or sometimes only covers the consumers that live within those. So it really helps us as a brand to, to spread our wings and understand our consumer across the entire board. Um, that was absolutely my favorite job yet at this, at this company. And I guarantee it will rival um, any job I have moving forward. And it's really what kind of put the stake in the ground as far as loving, not only loving what I do, but loving the company that I work for. Um, and the reason being is because in being an Eakin, you were a complete brand ambassador for Nike. Um, but what you got to do was see all the highs and lows of the consumer's experience and connection with a brand like Nike. And when you have as deep of a passion for sport as I do, being able to talk to those individuals, feel what those individuals feel when they buy a Nike shoe, when they watch LeBron score 50, those feelings are palpable. And I think it's so important as marketers to, for lack of a better term, be an empath. You, you have to fully understand what it is your consumers are feeling and taking away from your brand whatever story you're telling 
in order to, to continue that strength and that relationship and that connection to each of them. So what brings me back to work every single day is when we tell a story about a young tap dancing group out of New York that do what they do every day because they love it. And if that inspires another young girl across the country to want to pick up tap dancing because she's inspired by that story, that makes what we do every single day, all the stress worth it. Um, so I think it's going to be hard if I ever make a decision to leave the company in which I work for, because I do believe in the strength of, of if you want to be a long-term marketer, if you want to go into business for yourself, like Tiffany, like I admire that so much. It's something that I want to do myself. You do need to understand the vast difference of, company to company, industry to industry, to really hone in on all of your marketing skills, on your entire bag of tricks, um, on your entire bag of skills. Um, but it's, it is really hard when you find that connection and ultimately what drives you, which for me, it is sport, and to not want to break that relationship. So it's, it's a balance. And I'm, I'm definitely, some of the, some of the panelists, um, I'm definitely more early in my career than, than some of you. And um, this panel is even more helpful for me, I feel like in some ways, um, but that ultimately does, does drive me every single day is that connection to sport and how I can bring that to, to individuals. Jamie, can we answer that question also? How do you make your brand admirable? Well, I think Amazon as a brand, I don't know how many people I could even ask today who wouldn't know what our number one objective is and it will it always starts and it ends with the customer um, everything we do from beginning to end is always customer focused and so when you think about what consumers uh, associate with the brand a trustworthy experience fast and efficient delivery you're going to get what you order um, all of these things are imperative to maintaining the Amazon brand. And that's foundational to ensuring the success of the company. And it's not about branding. It's really the whole intention is to provide an amazing customer experience. Anything that harms that customer experience is an existential threat. That's a, something we want to address quickly, effectively, make better regardless of the scenario. And so we invest millions of dollars in ensuring that fraud, abuse, uh, bad customer experiences don't happen. And if they do, we take appropriate actions to make it right. And so that's where I think foundationally as a business, you have to decide what is your core objective. And if it's to provide an amazing customer experience, no matter what you're doing, because we sell products, we have data centers, we have a uh, food places now, Whole Foods, obviously, we're also doing our uh, fun little go in and out without even having to check out. We're all over the place. And that's intentionally all developed with the customer in mind. How can we add value? And so everything that we do is centered around that core customer. And that's how you bring build brand admiration, if you will. Good. I'm going to talk about some leadership questions, culture, and, and um, some growth. So Jamie, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Stephen Jobs, may you rest in peace. He had a great quote. His quote was, I don't hire smart people to tell them what to do. I hire them so they can tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. You follow that in your company? And if so, what's working with that and what's not working with that? That's a great question. And I think as you grow in your career and even the stages from you know independent contributor to manager to leader are all pretty significant. And I've I've transitioned recently from, from manager to, to leader. Um, and I absolutely believe in that quote. I, I, I believe in cumulative value of brains and, and experiences, um, diversity and experience. Um, and I think that if you're doing your job as a leader, you're clearing the path for your team, you're setting them up for success and letting them do what they do best. Um, I can't by any means achieve on my own what my team can achieve together. So my role is to make sure that they're set up for success, that they're inspired and motivated, they have the resources that they need to get their job done um, and have all the context. And then that I'm managing up to executives as well to ensure that everything that we're working towards as a team 
is going to serve the greater good for the business. So, yep, I think it's spot on and it's definitely something that I've been very focused on in the last few years of my career. Stacy, can you answer that question also? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, for sure that the very best people that I've had on my team and the very best people that I've hired have been the ones where we sort of have that um, terrific uh, combination of skills, right? So uh, I am not the person to pull together a massive deck of uh, timelines and what's due and when. I'm not the person who can follow all of the the due dates from day to day. I'm, I'm much more that person in the room who's just vomiting out a thousand ideas. And I need people in the room to be like, okay, hold on, we're only working on this right now, all right? Um, and help keep me in line and keep me uh, from being a hot mess every day. So um, I think that you you absolutely have to value your team and realize that they're, they're bringing to the table as much as you are. And, and there never should be that ego in terms of like, I'm the one with the answers, right? And especially in today's world, because if you've got leaders at the top who believe that they're the only ones that have the answers, we're gonna have a problem because like it or not, uh, you know, especially here in the US, we have tons of older white privileged men at the top and it's imperative that the employees uh, are, are being valued and speaking up because that's the only way that we're ever going to change, um, you know, that, that sort of hierarchy and have more voices in the room. Good. Thank you. Tiffany, again, you know, knowing your, your, knowing your position, your role, your company, what skills have you found that are essential for success in brand management and marketing? I think the ability to hold yourself accountable to what a goal is versus what a wish is. Um, it's really hard, we're all human. Um, it's really hard to separate what you want from what should be done. And if you're lucky, a lot of times those are the same thing. Um, but a lot of times it's someone else's idea. Um, it's inspiration from an industry that's not your own or from a background that you're not you know, super expert in and you have to sit back and listen before you react. Um, I think it's the ability also to understand your lane. So when we approach client work at Context & Co, we always try and get really, really honest about what, what lane do you authentically want to own as our client. Um, you can't own them all, and we're not going to react to every other brand that comes along that sounds similar to what you're doing. So, you know, let's, let's be true to one thing at a time. Um, I think the best leaders have a sense of that, and so it empowers people around them to speak up, to call themselves out when they're wrong, but also to hold each other accountable um, and do your best work. Good. Ashley, can you answer that too? I think in today's world, especially as we're accelerating so much to digital, for me, I think such a valuable skill set is to be data driven. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of the decisions we make, especially as Stacy mentioned, at Urban Outfitters, they're all fueled by real time data. So if you know you see a trending search on X trend because of some because some celebrity wore a certain shirt, you need to be able to like react to that trend quickly. Um, so I think that what has set people apart the most, like especially with teams that I've been on across multiple companies is data driven. And then another thing that I think is so important is just the ability to be collaborative and to, to work well with others. It's such an easy thing, but it goes such a long way. Um, I've worked with people like huge teams with completely different personalities. You're going to disagree and that is totally okay. It's bringing your idea to the table and understanding someone else's opinion and even though that might be different from yours you know at the end of the day you're still working towards the same goal so you have to you have to see where you guys could compromise so i think collaborativeness is so important and the ability to be data driven which in today's world you you could pick up that skill set there's so many free tools online right now where you could learn google analy analytics you could learn Adobe Analytics and um, I think it's it's just an easy uh, a thing that you could you could pick up. My line is he who owns he those who own the data are the kings but since I'm with all women on a panel those who own the data are queens so kind of corrected myself there. I have one more I, love that. I, have, one more I have one more question because it's 10 minutes but I want each one of you to answer it 
And this is my favorite question because this was the brainchild of how Jen and I created this five years ago at Blue Chip having coffee. Um, and it's not about what we learn in a textbook or a room. It's not any disrespect to Meg or Jen or anybody else. But I'm gonna start at the top of my screen, Melanie, and start with you. And we each have about a minute and a half or two minutes. And that is, what advice can, give to the, can you give to these students that they're not gonna learn in class or they're not gonna learn in a textbook? Well, and I, I wanted to add on to the, to the traits too of a good marketer. So maybe this will kind of cover both. Um, something that I've had uh, to learn um, in, my, in my career thus far is removing the personal. And I think, um, I think marketing is definitely an industry where um, it's very easy to get lost in, in your own sort of personal view of situations, of, um, of the consumer. To be honest, it can make you a great marketer as well. Um, but I think when you're talking about an industry and a profession that at a lot of times rely on your ability to challenge perspective and your ability to kind of think of an idea that maybe nobody else in the room can see. Um, so in, 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 in that frame of mind, it's very easy to get lost in uh, your own way and take things maybe a little too personal, maybe over stress about situations. So I, I think um, in focusing on ultimately what you want to do within the marketing industry, that's a whole different path. But um, I hope the other panelists would agree with me in saying that um, no matter what it is you do, you're always working with people and people are always going to stress you out. Um, and I think your ability to reflect on how, whether it's your company or your coworkers make you feel uh, and what you ultimately as a person can handle should be what helps you make those hard decisions. Right. Um, whether it's to accept a job, whether it's to end your job, um, whether it's to make a move, whatever it is, always come back to center. And knowing your own truth is what is gonna bring you the most success whatever it is that you do. Good. So. Stacy, same question. What yeah. advice do you give to these students? 190 of them who are looking at this. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I think uh, I, I majored in arts administration. So I, I wasn't even a, you know, an advertising or a marketing major. Um, and for me, I think the, the biggest learning, especially in marketing and branding, it's less about the, um, uh, you know, what you'll learn in a marketing textbook. And I think marketing really is about, it's almost like you're a ghostwriter for the biography of these brands, right? So it, what's more important is uh, absorbing information, absorbing culture, reading everything you can read, being on social media, I'm probably more times than my partner wants me to be, just constantly looking at everything. And so when you're in the room and someone drops some sort of reference, you've got somewhere to take it and you can keep rolling with it. And obviously that takes time because, you know, uh, about a decade into your career, you'll be like, oh yeah, I remember when Louis Vuitton did that campaign. That was amazing, blah, 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 blah. But just being someone who has an interesting point of view in the room. Um, you know, my first internship, I was 19 years old. I was at Jane Magazine, RIP, so good. I don't know if you guys will even know what that is, but it was great uh, back in the 90s. Um, and I just was this intern sitting at the table who, as you can tell, loves to chat and was just throwing out ideas and didn't think of myself as an intern. Of course, lots of respect and was like, do you need a coffee? Do you need a sandwich? But also wasn't afraid to be like, wouldn't it be cool if? And then that made them like me and remember me. And then I got another internship. And then 10 years later, the very same woman who hired me to be director of marketing at Glamour was the woman who was my intern supervisor at Jane Magazine. And so I think that's the way you can make people remember you. That's the, the way that people will be like, oh yeah, it, it's less about, oh man, she's a great writer and her decks were great. It's more about, she always had an interesting point of view. And I think absorbing that information, reading books, reading magazines, watching TV um, is, is probably more critical as, as a brand marketer and as a creative marketer than you know, anything you'd, you'd read in a book. Sorry, sorry, professors. No, I agree with that. When I'm in my office working and I always tell the people I'm working with, if you're coming into my office, make sure you come in with an idea, bad, good, or indifferent. Come yep. in with an idea because you'll stimulate a conversation with me. Totally. So okay, Jamie, you're next. What are you going to tell these students? 
Well, it, it's it's the perfect uh, follow up to you, Stacy, and and I wrote it down, so I'm not stealing yours. But fi find ways to continue to be inspired, which essentially is what you're saying. Um, you know, I think you can get lost in the day to day and the stress and the to do list. And as long as you are continuing to be interested in things that you find intriguing or you're curious about, um, allow time for that, regardless of what you have to do in a day, because that ultimately is what gives you perspective in what is happening with others, what is happening with culture, ideas that are coming from others within the organization. Um, and it's giving you perspective. And if you can allow the time for yourself to be exposed by that, it also provides an energy with the team and with the organization as a manager, as a leader, as people who are um, we're in the business of ideas, quite frankly, um, and sharing ideas and perspectives with about a company. Um, and so allowing for that time is critical because um, it's, it's really the energy that keeps us all going. I love that word inspiration. I'm going to steal it. I'm going to put it on my blackboard. I'll give you credit, maybe, but I'm going to steal it. Tiffany, what are you going to tell these students? Oh, okay. So inspiration, inspiration, inspiration is like the top. And so to piggyback on that, I'd say find ways to keep yourself fueled apart from the work that you do and keep your identity intact and yourself intact apart from the work that you do. Now that can still mean connecting to people in your industry but not doing it in a way that feels tied to the money that you're making or the clout that you're building. Um, I've had so many toxic work environments to be very honest that were with great people and those are now my clients. You know why? Because they were great people, they were smart, they thought I was smart and they knew that working together at some point could be great. Um, so maintaining yourself, maintaining your own sense of intelligence and dignity and ability to show up in the world, whatever you need to do to do that, that is as important as doing the work that's put on your desk every morning. Um, so inspiration and that too. Good. Bailey? There's a few things. I would say uh, soft skills are as important as your hard skills, honestly. I think I've known plenty of people, especially working in a tech company, who have amazing hard skills, but their soft skills are not up to par. And it's difficult to work with those people. So I would say, especially in marketing, where you are bridging gaps, you're bringing people together, uh, you need to be able to earn trust. You need to be able to demonstrate that you can influence without authority. How are you going to get influence roadmaps if you don't have a direct reporting relationship? It's by earning trust and building those relationships. So I would heavily focus on building up your soft skills as well. I would also think of yourself as a brand. Like you, across your career, you're gonna work for many companies. Maybe some people work for one, but most are gonna work for many. And your brand is what's gonna be consistent, yourself, what you're known for, what you're known in the industry for. Likely you're gonna go from brand to brand in a similar industry that you're going to build up a reputation around the work that you do. You want that reputation to reflect you in the most genuine way and also to attract people to you. When you're passionate about something, people can tell. And I will say you are much more compelling as a marketer, as a teammate, as a leader, when you are passionate about the work that you're doing. And you can find that passion in many different places. You can be passionate about the brand you're working for. You can be passionate about the specific project or really just the, the overall mission of the company. Um, but find that passion, root yourself in that, and really allow that to drive you in the long term. You can't Google this question because we have Ashley here, so she's gonna answer it in person. Mm -hmm. Ashley, you're, you're the last respondent to go for this question, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Jen, but what are you gonna tell these students that they're not gonna learn by Jen or Meg or their textbooks? The one thing I wish I knew was that it is okay to fail. And I wish that I heard that more often when I was navigating my career and when I graduated college, because I think as soon as I graduated college, I felt so much pressure to find a job, to excel in my job, to figure out what I wanted to do and be good at it. And Sometimes for some people, it works out great. Um, you know, you're at the same company you've been at for, you know, X amount of years and you're happy. But um, I think that I, I've talked to a lot of young grads or people that are nervous about graduating college and they're not sure what they, they want to do uh, in their career. And I think that that's okay. You know, I think people... 10 years in their career I've talked to still don't know what they want to do. And so it's okay to drive through 
you know, post-grad world with uncertainty. Um, and it's okay to, you know, enter a job and then realize that you want to pivot industries. Just one example in my career, when I, uh, first graduated college, I thought I wanted to work in the magazine industry. And I had, um, a couple different internships at the magazine industry. And I thought like, this is what I was meant to do. And then a couple months in, I realized that I hated the work I was doing. I, I just was not happy. And it was really scary to take an honest look to say, like, do I see myself doing this for the next five to 10 years? And so I think that, you know, it, it's okay to make those changes and those leaps. And sometimes it's scary, but, um, you know, failing is great. And I think that celebrating failures are also good. I do it at work all the time where I will share my failures, my day-to-day -day failures with folks on my team so they could learn from it. And I think that there's this big stigma or there's a, a stigma with being, you know, perfect and imposter syndrome, especially at large companies is a real thing. But I think just, you know, being transparent and human about this approach and um, I think at the forefront of our work, we're always around people. We're always, you know, working with different teams. So really not forgetting that like we're all human at the end of the day. Um, and it's important to connect with others on a human level. And that failure component, I think, goes hand in hand. So being in business for many years, I think I've learned more from failures than I have from successes. And with that, you know, my, my little motto that I have is, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is for permission. And with that, you know, you, you, you fail and you learn. So you've all been terrific. It's 702. I'm within 120 seconds, Jen. That's okay, right? It's plus or minus for the percent. Um, we still have more to go, um, but I learned a lot. I took a lot of notes in between the questions I asked, um, but I'm going to turn it over to my boss, Jen. <laughs> uh, this was amazing. I, uh, I actually was taking notes during this and I love that you did take us beyond the textbook. I felt like you talked a lot about a lot of the things that we look at in my classes um, and looking at the, the list of attendees. I appreciate so many of our students coming to this event. Uh, alumni I saw from Prime were at the event, uh, various, the Dean's office is here. Um, so appreciate so many people being involved in supporting this event. Um, clearly our panelists, Timmy, um, we thank you so much and you have inspired us all to sort of go beyond the textbook and think about holding ourselves accountable and being empathic and um, you know, absorbing the information around you. There was so much that we took from this that I know we will all carry further. Um, so I wanted to thank Timmy. I would like to thank each of our panelists for taking the time to do this and for inspiring us. Um, I also wanted to quickly just say a few other thank yous. Um, I know that Penn State Prime has worked really hard on this. So some of the folks that you see on the screen, Isabel, Toby, Sebastian, the exec board, uh, Ad PR Club, uh, led by Leah Moynihan and um, Mark Birschbach, we really appreciate their support as well this year. Um, our marketing department did a lot to help us out, Aaron Messino in the front office and Meg Malloy. Um, and again, just the support of our, um, you know, alumni office and uh, Dean's office and so on. Um, with that, I would just like to say thank you so much for your support. And I know that we have an opportunity to speak with the panelists one on one. And so I'm going to let Isabel tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, definitely. And again, I would just like to express my thank yous again to all of the panelists. You all had such great insights and perspectives to share and I really enjoyed myself and I'm sure the rest of our attendees did as well. I'd also like to thank all of our attendees for being here. I think this is a really great opportunity and appreciate your support and interest in it. That being said, I did just send out two links in the chat. So the first is to a feedback form about this event. So we really appreciate any feedback you guys have so that we can continue to make sure that next year's event is even better. The second is a document that has six separate Zoom links. So each panelist here will have their own Zoom room and you guys have the opportunity to go speak with them individually. So feel free to hop around, visit multiple different Zoom rooms, but that's how you'll access these as well. This was great. And if I didn't, didn't say it also, I wanted to mention that Timmy has, uh, you know, he's the one who inspired this idea five years ago. I think I, I, that was mentioned earlier on, but I just wanted to also say a special thank you to Timmy for, uh, you know, seeing this effort through the last five years, uh, the amount of time you've put into this, we really appreciate it. Yeah, uh, that you never, one person just doesn't make it happen. It's a total team effort. 
Um, you come up with an idea, but it's all about, and everybody in the panel can tell you, ideas are great. It's about execution and implementation of those ideas and the pull through. So, um, you know, that's the most important thing that has to happen. And, and um, you know, we, we learn um, from our mistakes. We learn from previous panel discussions. We'll learn from this one. We'll make it bigger and better. But to me, it's about giving back to the students. I'm fortunate enough to be able to do that. And that's probably the most important thing. There's not a price tag in the world you can put on that. And when you have great panelists, all of which, and, you know, now, now you know, we can throw Tiffany in there as quasi Penn State, Smeal, whatever. Um, that's the most beautiful thing in the world. And our network. Honorary alumni, yeah. Our network is wide. Our, 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 our tent is getting bigger. Um, so it's terrific. So, so Isabel, the toughest thing I have to do now is figure out how to get into my private room. So I might we'll, be, you know. So join us. We will see you in the breakout rooms next. Yes, thank you all so much. Yeah.